All right, I think we can get started here, maybe a little bit early, save a little time for the end. But uh, I wanted to welcome Dr. Eve Lee to our club uh, meeting here. Uh, really appreciate your time tonight, uh, uh, Eve. It's terrific to have you. I know you're up at uh, in Montreal. Um, Dr. Lee is uh, a professor there at McGill University, and uh, you did your PhD work, I know, at the University of California at Berkeley. And I think some of your undergrad work there as well. And then I know from um, that you also spent some time in Toronto. Um, and all, all basically astrophysics, I think, related uh, academic work. And, uh, you know, she's also the recipient uh, of, as I was reading here, the Annie, Annie Jump Cannon Award earlier this year which um, is a super uh, prestigious award given to uh, women researchers in the field of astronomy. So uh, congratulations on that. Um, we're so glad to have you. Uh, we're super interested in the topic here. Um, you know, we live in a time when we are the generation that has discovered these exoplanets and things. It's an amazing time to be um, you know, alive, but interested in astronomy. We're very fortunate, and we look forward to the things that you can share with us tonight to uh, further our understanding, uh, Dr. Lee. So, um, Novak, folks, if you have questions like we always do, post them in the chat box, and we'll we'll circle back at the end of the meeting. And uh, so I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Lee. All right. Thanks, Paul, for the kind introduction. Just want to make sure that everyone can hear me well. Great. Awesome. All right. OK, um, so as Paul said, I'm a theoretical astrophysicist. I work at McGill University here in Montreal, Canada, as a professor in physics. And my research interest focuses around the formation of planets and stars. And even though I'm a theorist, I'm very much motivated by the interesting patterns that we see in the observed properties of worlds out there. So extrasolar planets or exoplanets, as we call them. So I always like to give a brief story about how I first got interested in this field. So Paul is absolutely right that we are the generation where we have discovered this planet. And the very first detection of an exoplanet actually falls off this chart. This is a cumulative number of detection as a function of the discovery year. It just falls off the chart. It was before I was born um, in 1988. And if you have not heard about this, then it's probably because it was such a controversial detection at the time. Even now, detecting a planet is extremely difficult because these are really tiny objects with respect to this massive bright star that it orbits around. So you can just imagine just how difficult it was back in the 80s. And in fact, it wasn't until the early 2000s that people have gone back to this particular observation to verify that indeed this really was a bona fide exoplanet. And also, it turns out this star was not quite normal, well, in the sense that it was a binary system. So this planet was in a system with two stars. So what won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2019 was the first detection of an exoplanet around a sun-like star. That's an important qualifier because one of the major motivations that drive this field is to search for this Earth version 2.0 or solar system version 2.0 to answer the questions like, are we in a very unique system or are we in a system that looks just like the other worlds out there? Because this leads into the question of, is there life out there beyond Earth? And then Q2009, that's when we have the launch of the Kepler Space Telescope by NASA. And this instrument really revolutionized this field by finding thousands and thousands of exoplanets. And it's not just the number, the sheer number of detections that was so important. It was just how weird these planets were. These planets look nothing like what we found in the solar system. And also, these planets just defied our previous notion of how we think planets should form. So they just look so weird. 
And right now we have more than five, I think we just went over 5,000 detection of the exoplanets thanks to Kepler, but also the ongoing space missions like TESS. So I started my graduate school in 2012. And before I entered graduate school, when I was applying, I knew that I wanted to go into this field and I also wanted to be a theorist. And the reason for that is because this is around the time where I was going to a lot of seminars and colloquia at my undergraduate institution, University of Toronto. And we ended up having a lot of visitors that told us about the preliminary analysis that they're finding from the Kepler Space Telescope. And just looking at just the huge amount of data that's coming in and just how weird they look um, got me really interested and made me feel like this was a field where even a young budding researcher like me could make a, a, a meaningful contribution. And uh, to this day, and I uh, just continued that route and I'm, I continue to have a lot of fun uh, working in this field. So, to take a look at the measured properties of the exoplanets, there are a few basic quantities that we look for. The first one, which is the most basic, is their orbital period. Then we take a look at the masses, and we also take a look at the size of the planets. So I believe I'm talking to the audience who really appreciate the observational part of astronomy. So to tell you the four major discovery methods, there are many different discovery methods, but there are four major ones. So the first is transit. Those are the blue points over here. And this is what the Kepler used. This is also what TESS is using up in the sky right now. This is just looking at a star, monitor its brightness over time. And if the star has an orbiting planet, as a planet, orbits around and crosses our line of sight, it's going to block out a certain portion of the star so that we see a dip in the light curve from the star. The frequency of this dip tells us the orbital period of the planet. The depth of this dip tells us the relative size of the planet with respect to their host star. So that's something important to keep in mind. Transit tells us the size of the planet, and only in very special cases, it tells us the mass of the planet. So if we were to figure out the mass of those planets detected by transit method, we have to follow it up by using the more traditional radial velocity methods, which was the method that was used to for those first detections. So radial velocity is looking at the spectra of the stellar atmosphere. And as the star, quote unquote, wobbles around, or more precisely, it orbits around the center of mass, which got shifted due to the gravity of the orbiting planet, then the spectral lines get shifted, gets blue shifted when the star comes towards us and gets red shifted as the star moves away from us. Just like the Doppler effect, in fact, we call this the Doppler radial velocity. Uh, just like the Doppler effect, when the car zooms towards you, you hear higher and higher pitch. And as the car zooms away from you, you hear lower and lower pitch or frequency. It's the exact same principle. And those are the black points. You also see these red points over here. Those are directly imaged planets. So this is literally taking a picture of the planet, um, which is very difficult. And also because you need to collect the light coming from the planets themselves, these planets have to be massive, and they also have to be very young. And they also have to be far away from the star so that you can resolve their signals away from this really bright light coming from the star. So this is a real life image just stitched together of a very famous system called HR 8799. These are the four super Jupiters that have been resolved orbiting around this star. Finally, this yellow point, those are the micro lens planets. And this uses a relativistic effect. So the bending of the light due to the gravity of some object. And usually we do this by looking towards the center of the galaxy where there are a lot of concentration of stars. And those light from that concentration of the star gets bent due to the gravity of some foreground star. And if this foreground star has an orbiting planet, then that planet also acts as a secondary lens. So you have uh, extra magnification of the light. And this extra magnification tells us how massive we think this planet is. 
So these are the four major detection methods of this planet that tell us either size or the radius and uh, or either size and the mass and orbital period of these planets. And let's go back to this question of the difference between our solar system and the systems out there. So you'll note that I have these diamond points over here. Those are the solar system planets. And you just notice right away just how different these are compared to the exoplanets. For now, let's just focus on these diamonds, just our solar system. Our solar system is very much an ordered system. We have this small planet from Mercury to Mars, close to the sun, and we have this large planet, Jupiter to Neptune, far away from the sun. You look at the extrasolar planets, and they are really all over. In fact, even a really short orbital period, like inside 10 days, we can have planets that is as massive as Jupiter or even larger, all the way down to planets that, that is about the size of the Earth or even smaller. So you really run the full gamut when we go outside of our solar system. And in that sense, our solar system is kind of weird in that we don't have any of the short period planets. And you can look at this and you might think, well, this clump that I keep highlighting here looks kind of sparse. Um, uh, I hope people can see my cursor. Uh, I, I actually can't see anyone. Can someone verify that people can see my cursor? Yep, yeah, we can see it. Okay, great. All right. So the this clump over here, oops, this clump over here that I keep highlighting, if you correct for all the detection biases and do the statistical analysis, turns out about one in two sun-like stars have exactly these type of planets that are very close in, so short orbital periods, and also have this intermediate size that fill in this gap between the Earth and Neptune that we just don't have in the solar system. So when you hear statements like, our solar system is unique, that's really what we mean. Um, we can't say anything more than that because at the moment, we don't have the technical capabilities to really detect the solar system version 2.0. It's really hard to detect this small planets at long orbital periods. Okay, so these blue points, as I said, these are these come from the transit methods. And even though I'm plotting in terms of mass so that I can actually show all these different discovery methods, it's really the transit and therefore the size of the planets where we have the most data. We have about 5,000, so a few thousand of those. By comparison, we only have a few hundred detections or the measurements of the mass of the planets. So we often use the size of the planets or the radius of the planet to give to categorize these planets into different subclasses that is based on where they lie on the spectrum between the more rocky part or the more gassy kind. So the smaller the planets are, the more rocky they are. So these are all small terrestrial or rocky planets like Mercury or Mars. And then we get to the size of the Earth. And from the size of the Earth to about 1.7 times the size of the Earth, we call them as the super Earths. So think of them as rock that is larger than the Earth. It might have some very tiny little atmosphere on top of it. And then from about two Earth, two Earth radii to about four Earth radii, we call them as mini Neptunes because they're smaller than Neptune, but they are distinguished from this rocky planet because they must have some thick atmosphere. So just to give you some idea of how thick or thin these atmospheres are, for these mini Neptunes, their envelope, their gaseous atmosphere by mass is about 1 to 10%. So 1 to 10% of its total mass is locked into this gaseous atmosphere. As compared to our Earth, for example, we know our Earth has atmosphere, otherwise we wouldn't be here. But that atmosphere in the grand scheme of things is really tiny. Only about one parts per million of the total mass of the Earth is locked into this atmosphere. And then going further out to the right, we have more gaseous planets all the way out to the gas giants like our own Jupiter and Saturn's. And the key point here is that these large planets, these gassy planets are very rare as compared to their smaller counterparts by about a factor of 10 or more. 
So for some reason, our galaxy preferred the formation of these small planets as compared to these large planets. So why is that? And this is when we get into the question of how we think the planets form. And planet formation begins with the formation of stars. Stars form in what we call as a giant molecular cloud. Here is one example. This is a famous example. Um, many of you probably have seen this. This is Pillars of Creation in the Eagle Nebula from the Hubble Space Telescope. This is an actual scientific image. And we've actually zoomed into one part of it. These clouds are basically loosely bound structure of dense material, dense gas and dust. So if you try to put yourself inside these clouds, you, first of all, you don't want to do that because this is a pretty fatal environment. The kind of wind speeds that we're talking about, like if you'd like to figure out what exactly happens inside these clouds, all this gas flow reaches the wind speed of about 2,200 miles per hour. So that's about 100 times stronger than the typical dusty situation that we find on Earth. So you definitely don't want to be in here, but it's a good, good environment for star formation. So 2,200 miles per hour, that's actually strong enough for these winds, this flow, to go over the sonic barrier. Um, so for those of you who are familiar with the Mach numbers, we are talking about Mach number of about 10. So that means there's going to be a lot of shock. And at those shock fronts, there will be some overdense regions at those shock fronts. And those overdense clump will collapse under its own soft gravity, creating stars. So while you have this collapse by the gravity of those clumps, there's also spin. Like anything in this universe, it has some spin. Everything is spinning to some degree. So if you've ever tried to squish something that is spinning, uh, maybe you've done some pottery work. Uh, if you've ever tried to do that, you might recall that it's, hard to, it's harder to squish that in one direction. So in fact, if you try to squish something that is spinning, you're going to end up with a pancake. So around these stars, you have this spinning disk of gas and dust. And we think the planets form inside this spinning disk of gas and dust. So we call these disks as protoplanetary disk. So let's zoom in to this protoplanetary disk and ask the question of, in more detail, how exactly does the planet form? So let's first ask the question of, what is a planet? So if I were to describe a planet into its very, very, very basic form, I will call it as a rock with some gas on top. So that rock is solid. So that solid has to come from the solids inside this disk. And I said, this is a spinning disk of gas and dust. So those dust grains somehow coagulate and grow into this large rock that is massive enough to hold on to some gaseous atmosphere. So while that's going on, the disk gas itself is also evolving. Not all those solids and gas goes into the planet. In fact, far away from the star, the gas gets blown away by the wind generated by things like UV ray and X-rays from the star. And also on the inside, we know that the gas gets funneled onto the star following the stellar magnetic field lines. We know that because we can directly measure it by looking at the spectra of these young stellar objects. So this means that over time, the disk all, gas all gets dissipated away. And in fact, we know this has to be true because in our solar system, we have no problem observing on Earth the beautiful Jupiter or the beautiful rings around Saturn or Venus, or if you're lucky, sometimes Mars. The fact that we can see them means that there is very little gas that is between us and all those neighboring planets. That means all this gas must have all dissipated away. So if we were to think about how planets form and what kind of planet that we end up with, we do have to put that in the context of what the underlying disk is doing. If this planet starts forming very early, then there's lots of gas around, so it's much easier to create these gas giants. But if the planet starts assembling very late, then there's limited amount of gas around, so it'll be much harder to create this gas giants. So let's now zoom in to how the planet actually starts to build up its gaseous atmosphere. 
Let's start from the point where we already have assembled this rock that is massive enough so that it can gravitationally attract and hold on to some atmosphere. So this atmosphere is bound, gravitationally bound to this rock. And at the very beginning, once, once the gas has already been bound to this planet, this is a really hot gas because all that gravitational potential energy has been transformed into heat. And in reality, you are going to have a temperature gradient where it's much hotter in the deeper layers of this envelope and cooler at the upper layer of the envelope. And whenever you have such, such structure, that gas is going to cool. Um, it's just like when you make tea or coffee um, and, and, and you make a hot tea or hot coffee, so it's hot, but once you put it down, on and in uh, wherever your office or home, the surrounding air is much cooler than your coffee or tea. And you know from what we know from our experience that over time that coffee or tea is going to cool. It's the exact same principle here with the extra, extra thing is that we're dealing with the gas and not liquid. And when it comes to gas, when a ball of the gas cools, it actually shrinks. So this is a bit hard to see from liquid. You really have to look at this from the gas perspective. And there's a really cool demo that you can make and see to, to see that this really happens in real life. Uh, as long as you have an easy access to liquid nitrogen. I didn't have easy access to liquid nitrogen. So um, I had to pull this out of the YouTube video. So pardon me while I switch the, uh, sorry. While I switch, let me see if I can switch. Whoops. Pardon me while I switch. Hmm. Sorry, there's some technical difficulty here. Can people see yeah. the YouTube video? Well, this is black on our end, but you could, I mean, you could play it maybe without the voice, uh, without the sound, and you could talk to it maybe. Or... Yeah, maybe I'll do that. All right, let me go back to... It's all work in rehearsal, but uh, it doesn't work tonight. Yeah, well, we did check this. Sorry about that, but uh, here's a demo. Um, can you at least see the video? Yep, we can see. Okay, but no audio. Uh, looks like it's <clears throat> starting here. Yeah, no audio. No audio. Okay, no problem. All right. So um, again, the credit goes to the author of this video. Um, you can find this on YouTube. Just search for pressure demo balloons in liquid nitrogen. So the point here is that um, uh, he's going to he's going to prepare balloons. Um, that one has a helium. This one is going to use his breath. So that means um, it's air. And he's going to put it into liquid nitrogen, which will cool down the air inside the balloon. And watch what happens to this balloon. It's shrinking. So it shrinks just by cooling the air inside the balloon. And what's really cool is that as it pulls this out of the liquid nitrogen, just going to do it soon. Watch what happens to the balloon. It goes back to its original shape. Again, just by pulling it out of the liquid nitrogen. So uh, what's happening there is that the air in, the, in that room is hotter than the air inside the balloon. So that has to heat up the, heat up the air inside the balloon so it grows back to 
its uh, its original shape. So uh, going back to the planet atmosphere, again, um, you have this ball of gas, or rather a shell of gas that's cooling down, so it's going to shrink. And that means now this planet has all this empty space to fill it back up by adding even more gas within its gravitational sphere of influence. So that's how planets build this gaseous envelope. It, it builds because the envelope cools down. So based on that simple physics, we can do more careful calculation to, to derive this uh, equation. The only reason why I'm showing this equation is because I would like to highlight the three key ingredients that controls the rate at which this planet can cool down and therefore how massive its gaseous atmosphere can become. So the first ingredient is the, it's easy. It's just, it's just the time involved. So the more time you have to build up this gaseous envelope, obviously you're gonna you're gonna build up if you're gonna build a thicker envelope. The second ingredient is maybe not so maybe not so obvious. It has to do with the degree of pollution in those envelopes. So the less polluted these envelopes are, the easier it is to cool it down. It's it's not too dissimilar from the greenhouse gases in our Earth atmosphere that uh, heats up our heats up our planet. It's the exact same idea. Another way to think about it is uh, these polluters act as a blanket. So if you put blanket on top of something, that blanket is going to act as an insulator. It's going to um, trap the heat inside. And the whole point here is that you don't want to do that if you want to accelerate the growth process. So you want more pristine gas for that to happen. And the most important ingredient is the mass of this rock. In other words, the more heavier this rock is, the stronger its gravity, so it's much easier for that heavy rock to build more gas to gravitationally attract and build more thicker envelope. All right, so based on that, let's go back to our question of, why is it that our galaxy prefer the smaller planets? And let's focus on the time and the mass, the time involved and the mass of the core. And we're going to come back to this pollution part in the later part of the discussion. And based on what we have just discussed, the final fate of planets, or in other words, the final class of the planets, is basically determined at birth, how massive their cores are, that, that central rock, and when exactly they assemble. So here is the expected, from theory, the expected population of planets based on when they have formed. So going to the top, we have thicker atmosphere. Going to the right, we have heavier rocky core. And the different colors correspond to the different time at which their cores have assembled. So yellow are the cores that have assembled really early, just when the disk gas disappeared. So it has this, it has a lot of gas in the vicinity to hold on to, whereas these purple points are the ones that are formed really late. So uh, there was not enough gas around to build this gaseous envelope. So going from bottom to the top, we have the more rocky super Earths, and then the intermediate size mini Neptunes, and then the gas giants. Notice how hard it is to create these gas giants. We not only need these massive cores, but those massive cores also have to assemble really early to have all that gas around to build these gas giants. So maybe this difficulty is the reason why we have uh, the galaxy prefers these small planets. Um, so just as an FYI, I'm showing the model calculations, but any good theories need to be able to explain observations. So here are the actual data for the planets where it is possible to measure or infer the envelope mass fraction. In general, we have a good agreement except for this red points. There's a reason why I mark them as red. These are called the super cups. They require some special formation channel that I'm happy to discuss during q and if there's any interest. But again, going back to this question of why does our galaxy prefer these small planets, this seems to suggest that most planetary cores are, were rather light, and also they have taken a while to assemble. So why is it that these cores take a while to assemble? 
So here, let's now talk about how we think we can create this planetary course from the dust grains. So when I said the protoplanetary disks have all these dust grains, those dust grains are really tiny. They're about a micron. So uh, just to give you some idea, the micron size, um, it, that's about, take, take your strand of hair, take one strand of your hair, and uh, if you have a knife, if, if you somehow create a knife that could cut it along its length by about 20 times, so a few tens, tens of times, then you're going to have a micron. So that's really tiny as compared to this few thousand kilometer size rock that we're all sitting on or standing on right now. So somehow those tiny little dust grains have to grow into those planetary sizes. And you can just imagine how difficult and complicated the process is going to be. Let me just show you the few major parts of it. So the first step is one huge step, and I'm glossing over a lot of uh, current mysteries that uh, the, we are dealing with right now. But basically, it has to do with the electrostatic forces, which is the exact same physics of how, how the reason why you, have, you may have dust bunnies in your room or offices if you haven't cleaned it in a while. It's the exact same physics here. On top of that, also the aerodynamic drag the interaction between those solids and the nearby gas. And with that, you can jump all the way to about one to thousand kilometers. So think about like asteroids. And now you have to grow asteroids into like smaller things, let's say about Mars size, which is about 10 times smaller than the Earth. So this, this step involves aerodynamic drag and also the gravity because these these objects are massive enough that their gravity now starts to matter. And how do we go from Mars-sized object to earth size or even larger? Well, on top of aerodynamic drag and gravity, now you also have to consider the collision or mergers, whereby all I'm talking about there is that you have two similar sized objects and they uh, collide and mush and uh, create a bigger object. That's really all I mean by collision or mergers. So, most of the planets that we detect are very close to the central star. In those regions, turns out it's the collision of mergers that matters that dominates when it comes to the final size of these cores. So then we have to consider now, why is it that this collision of mergers might happen quite late so that we have all the small planets rather than the large planets? And again, to do that, we need to, again, think about this in the context of the disk evolution. We know that the disk gas dissipates over time. And our final goal is to create this planetary systems where you have few, few, few Earth size or larger planets. At the very beginning, when the disk is full of gas, you have all of these small rocks that are orbiting around the star, going along, traveling along nicely in their circular orbits, never coming into contact with each other. And why is that? Um, astronomers call this due to the gas dynamical friction. The closest analogy that I can think of is the following. So um, imagine uh, racing with your friend, but instead of racing in somewhere in the cityscape, you decided to race with your friend in a swimming pool. And you're not allowed to swim, you can only run through it. Uh, let's say it's shallow enough that you're not gonna drown, but anyways, you can only run through it. And let's also say that you are allowed, you and your friend are allowed to tackle each other. If you're in a swimming pool, if you have done this maybe as a kid, you might remember that it's really hard to run across the swimming pool as compared to when you just run uh, some, somewhere out on the streets in just plain air. So it's the exact same thing here. The reason why it's so hard to run across the swimming pool is that you have to run against all this like, dense water around you. So same thing here, you, these planets have to run against this dense gas material, and that's very difficult. You have to wait until all that gas is just about to disappear so that all these rocks can gravitationally perturb each other, make their orbits more elliptical, and have them collide and merge to create these super Earths or larger objects. So that is why we, it is naturally expected for this planetary cores to start assembling late 
so that our galaxy prefers the formation of these small planets rather than the large planets like what we see in our own Jupiter and Saturn. All right. So that solves one big mystery, but it's not like our galaxy doesn't have any gas giant. Our soul, as I said, our solar system has two gas giants. And in fact, about one in 10 sun-like stars have one gas giant, have at least one gas giant out to orbital distances of 10 astronomical units. So then how can we explain the existence of those gas giants? Well, let's go back to this core assembly process. And what we need is to bypass this collision and merger process and just straight away form this massive object. And turns out there are some special locations in the protoplanetary disk where this is possible. And we know that there is this special location because in the data, this is the number histogram of gas giants, so number of planets per 100 stars. You will note that there is a preferred region where we find this gas giants. It's somewhere, be it's, it's between 1 and 10 AU. So what's so special about this location 1 to 10 AU? And I'm going to approach this both from the core assembly process, but also from the, 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 the gas envelope growth process as well. Uh, before I do that, uh, just as a comparison, our own gas giants also fall within this peak. So Jupiter is at around 5 AU, so within this peak. Saturn is a bit farther out, but it's still inside 10 AU. So our solar system planets also fit in this picture as well. All right, so let's think about the core assembly process. Here is a very simplified version of how the disk would look like if you were, take, if you were to take a slice of it and just look at its cross section. The turquoise part, that's the gas part, and the speckled part, that is the dust part, we know we expect the dust disk to be thinner than the gas disk, and that has to do with the sedimentation of the dust, just like how the just like how in a um, in a calm water in a calm river flow, all those sediments um, fall to the bottom. It's the exact same physics, but only with the gravity of the star. Now you'll also note that I've drawn this disk so that it's thinner on the inside and thicker on the outside. And the reason for that is because as you go farther and farther and farther away from the star, the gravity from the star gets weaker and weaker. So the disk gets puffier and puffier because it's harder to like pull them down by this weak gravity from the star. And this thickness of the disk matters a lot because it sets you how massive, like what is the maximum possible size of this planetary cores. So if the disk is thinner, that maximum size of the core is also going to be small. And the reason for that is because these planets, these planetary cores, it's not just sitting nicely there. It's actually perturbing the disk. It gravitationally talks to the disk and ends up carving out a gap. And we know that there are gaps. This is an actual scientific image of protoplanetary disk, which tells us that there are rings and gaps. These are gaps in the dust. So we know that they exist. And the gaps are important because by carving out a gap, it acts as a barricade where all this outside material can no longer be fed into this inner regions. So that gives us this sort of like the maximum cap on how massive this planet could be. And that maximum size of the planet is going to be smaller when the disk is thinner, uh, just because it's easier to perturb something that is thinner. As compared to the outside, where the disk is thicker, it's much harder to perturb something that's really thick. Um, so, so the maximum size of the core is also going to be larger. Um, it's not too different from, I'm not sure if uh, those of you who go on a morning jog or go on hiking during the summertime, sometimes you come across like a swarm of little bugs. If that swarm of bug is really tight and small, it's much easier to just swap them away. But if it's really big and large and you had the unfortunate event that you came across it, then uh, it's much harder to swap them away. You will eventually just be surrounded. It's the exact same idea here. So. If this were to be uh, true just everywhere, then you might expect that 
well, it must be just easier and easier to create this giant planet as you go farther and farther away from the star. But we know that that is not the case. We know this from the observations of just where the gas giants are around their host stars. And it's the intermediate range. And that is because these cores, these planets take some time to build up to that maximum size. If they're closer to the star, then all the orbital times gets gets uh, gets shorter. So this planet takes much little time, um, much more little time to to sweep up all the material and build up to its size, as compared to on the farther side, farther away from the sun. Then it takes much longer for that planet to sweep up the surrounding material and grow to its maximum possible size. So to summarize. When you're close into the star, there's only so much you can accrete um, before you stop growing. But when you're too far away from the star, it just takes so long to reach that, to reach your uh, potential. So it is exactly this intermediate orbital distance where we think we would have these planets that are these planetary uh, cores that are massive enough. So let's now think about the gas accretion or rather the growth process of the gaseous atmosphere. To create gas giants, of course, we need this atmosphere to be as thick as possible. And to do that, we need to expedite that cooling process. And to expedite that cooling process, we need the gas to be less polluted, so more pristine. And turns out that one to 10 astronomical units where we see a lot of these gas giants is a special location in these disks. We call it the ice line or the condensation fronts, where beyond that, the disk is so cold that all those dust grains are coated with ice. And on the inside, the disk is hot enough so that ice layer all sublimates away. So we're dealing with the smaller grains. And in fact, these grains are just so brittle without that icy layer, they will just uh, collide and grind each other to something, something very fine. And it has an important implication in that these larger grains are much easier to be settled down, uh, to sediment away or to uh, fall through. Whereas the smaller grains tend to be more entrained with the gas, so they, they, will, they will just linger there. It's not too different from, again, like going back to the river flow. Let's say the river flow, uh, river flow also contains a lot of solids. That solids come in different shapes and size. The little pebbles tend to just all sink down, but tiny little sand grains tend to be all swept away. And uh, if there was lots of rain or like flooding, then that causes the river flow to look very muddy, like brown or reddish or yellowish. So on the outside, the gas is more pristine, but on the inside, the gas is more muddy with dust. And the upshot is that it's exactly at that one to 10 AU, where you have the gas giant formation, which is exactly the location where we see this preferred, preferred uh, site of where the gas giants would like to be as compared to the host star. All right, so astronomy, like any other science, scientific domains, it's the field where theorists like me need to be in close collaboration with observers that uh, give us all this data analysis and also with engineers that build these instruments that give us this amazing data. So how will future and some ongoing missions help this enterprise? And uh, just, just as a foreword, um, this list is very much biased by my own interests. There are, of course, many different missions that are relevant to to exoplanet science, but just keep in mind that these are the sort of top three that interest me the most. So the first is something that I'm really excited about is the Roman Space Telescope by NASA to be launched in 2027. This is a microlensing mission. And the reason why I'm so excited about it is that it has this unique capability. This is probably the only instrument where this is possible, where we can detect planets or something even smaller than planets at this at this uh, intermediate size orbital distances to really cover the region of this parameter space where you just have no data whatsoever right now. So this is going to tell us a lot about the mass 
uh, how the planetary masses are distributed all the way down to the mini Earth regime. And another thing that I'm excited about, it's already ongoing and it has already helped, uh, helped, uh, helped this field a lot, is to look for the dust content, the dust distribution, as well as the different gas composition in the protoplanetary disk. So, and that we're really just taking a picture and observing the initial stage of planet formation. And in fact, we already have uh, at least one bona fide uh, detection of a planet in its nascent stage while it's still forming. Um, and the system is called PDS-70, and it'll be really cool um, if we can find even more such planets, uh, more such, uh, such systems. And finally, um, as, uh, as the audience probably knows, the James Webb Space Telescope has been in the news a lot because we're all very excited. Exoplanet scientists are very excited about this too, um, uh, which has uh, successfully been deployed at its target location. And we're gonna see the first scientific image two days from now, so on Tuesday. And the reason why this is gonna be so exciting for exoplanet science is because it's going to tell us the chemical composition of planet atmospheres. And the goal here is to somehow connect that to infer where we think these planets have formed. And in this regard, another mission that I'm very excited about is European Space Agency's Ariel. So just like James, just like Webb Space Telescope, this is also focused on the chemical composition. But unlike Webb, Ariel is only looking at exoplanets. Webb is serving the whole astronomical community. Ariel is just for exoplanets. So this has the potential to give us a huge sample, huge uniform sample of the, the, the different chemical compositions of planets at different locations with respect to the star so that, we can, so that we can see some trends if they exist. So these are some of the missions that I'm very much excited about that can help us test the theories that theories and models that we work on in my group in the with the final goal to figure out how exactly do planets form so that we can understand this huge diversity that we see in exoplanets thank you yeah thanks uh thanks eve it was a terrific presentation we really uh learned a lot about how things uh formed um We've got a number of questions I want to go through, but um, yeah, really appreciate it. I'm, I'm just, uh, it's, I'm, I'm struck by how many, you know, there's four different methods you mentioned and how those are, you know, uh, all used for different kinds of uh, detections. I thought was was really interesting. Um, I, I guess while you're on this slide, where are these uh, Roman and Ariel? Where are they going? Is, it, is this like a James Webb type of orbit or uh, where do they end up? Um, yeah, good question. So I don't know exactly like which part of the orbit they're going to be, but uh, all I can tell you is that uh, it's going to be in the space. Um, uh, yeah, that, that's really all I can tell you right okay. now. All right, super. Um, so I know Jay Birch is full of questions as usual, which is good. Uh, Jay, why don't you ask your first one there, and then we'll circle back to you. I'm afraid, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I uh, lost my questions uh, <laughs> when I got disconnected momentarily. Oh, okay. I remember, though, that uh, I had some question about why the gas giants form farther away, and I sort of presumed that that's because the orbital shear of the gases is a lot lower farther away from the star as opposed to close into the star. Uh, is that reasonable? Um, yeah, I think I think I, I think you can think of it that that's that's part of it. Um, so uh, if you take a look at this plot again, um, you'll see, you're absolutely right that this gas giant tend to form far away, but not too far away, right? And that's that's really interesting. Like there's this like, special location where they form. So the reason for that is twofold. So the first is that the creation of, of, those, um, of those rocks, that uh, those massive rocks that are required for the gas giant uh, formation. Um, farther away, it's easier because um, it's just, it just takes the, the maximum size to which they can, they can be created, 
they, uh, the maximum size of this course that can be created, it's a larger. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's unfortunately a bit complicated, but like if I were to like simplify it, then I would say because it's just harder to perturb the disk at this far out location because the disk is thicker. Um, so, so you're so, saying it's more stable out there? uh it's more stable out there yes it's more stable against the uh, tidal disruption from the planet right so yeah. i also suppose that there's sort of a bell distribution of uh potential planetary makings uh, around a star uh too close and it just gets pulled in or blown away uh and uh, farther away it you know it's got nothing to keep it out there and so it I don't know why it's or why particles that are way far away, uh, you know, 20 or 30 astronomical units would deteriorate. Uh, is that is that a, a is are there tidal forces affecting those distant particles as well? Uh, so I think you're asking about the tidal force from the star. So if that's your question, then the tidal force well, is actually I I don't know that there isn't more gravitational force in the mass of the ring than of the star uh, as far as the uh, uh, external the exterior gases are concerned uh -huh. they're closer uh-huh uh, so like the farther away you go from the sun then the gravity of the planet of course matters more than the gravity from the star um, so in terms of like you also asked a question about the particles being blown away so um, this would matter for the gaseous envelope, for example. But um, uh, so closer to the star, it's much easier for all that envelope to be just like uh, uh, the blown away uh, because it's closer to the sun. So it gets it gets really hot and that hotter things are harder to keep together. Um, so that that is one way to get rid of its envelope. But uh, turns out like if you were somehow able to create these gas giants close to the close to the sun, and those are actually massive enough that uh, that it can hold on to those envelopes even close to the close to the sun. Yeah, I was surprised that the, that the inner limit is only nearly one astronomical unit. So we could have been a gas giant. It's just a little bit different. Yeah, uh, that that that's a really good point, right? Like, why is Earth Earth and not Jupiter, right? Um, yeah, uh, Earth, huh? I'm in favor of Earth. As yeah, of course, of course, right? I'm also in favor of Earth. Um, uh, yeah, so that's a really interesting question. So that goes back to this question of like, why is our solar system? Why does the solar system look the way it is? And uh, um, I don't think there's a very clear answer yet, other than saying that first of all, somehow our solar system, the inner planets, just somehow got created really, really late. And also, our solar system has these two giants. And these two giants were at very special locations where they uh, really perturbed the inner disk to get rid of a lot of the material. Um, and that's like one way out to explain why is it that our solar system planets are so small and tiny. Well, okay, the, uh, yeah. there are still four uh, gas giants. I, I mean, aren't. Uh, Neptune and Uranus uh, still considered gas giants? Oh, yeah, um, I call them ice giants. Um, so to me, gas giants have to be larger than Saturn. Um, but but yeah, I mean, Uranus and Neptune are also uh, are also sort of at the boundary. So uh, they are called ice giants just because they are so farther out. But yeah, you can consider them as uh, as giants as well. It's just that by mass, they're they're very they're tiny as compared to the Jupiter and Saturn. So that it's really the Jupiter and Saturn that shaped the overall architecture of our solar system, but not so much the Uranus and Neptune. Okay. Just Thank because you. they're less massive. Yeah. All right. Let's go. To, let's see, Jared. Uh, Jared Roberts, you want to ask your question? Jared was looking to see if there's a bias in the methods we use to detect planets. I'm not quite sure if he means what he means by bias, but is there one method that's easier or more, you know, truth telling or, you know, favored kind of thing? I guess it depends on um, 
yeah, I can't, you have any uh, response to that, I guess? Yeah, so um, all these methods have their own biases, just a different kind of biases. Um, oh, I see that my video has been turned off. Is that because I'm sharing screen? Um, I can see the, the screen, your screen. and uh, We don't see you. Uh, we see your screen, though. Yeah, it got turned. Some, for some reason, it got there turned go. off. Oh. Right. Okay, well, well, now you see my apartment, too. Okay, well, that's okay. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> all right, that's okay. Uh, okay, so all these methods have all have their own biases. Um, so transit is uh, only sensitive to short period planets and um, just short period planets, and uh, it also has this cut in terms of the size, and uh, and that's because of like how just how long it takes to collect all this data. So um, Kepler was supposed to run longer, but it couldn't because the reaction wheels failed, as you probably know. Um, and the way in which we know that the planets are there is not just from a single transit. We actually have to stack multiple transit signals on top of each other just because it's a tiny, tiny little signature. Um, so that means we have to, in order to detect something that's, say, at like 30 days, we need to detect this over at least like a year or more. We have to continuously look at this. And that's why it's so difficult to detect the long period planets. And that's just by um, the, the need to monitor a single star for a long time. Um, and also the radial velocity, um, it has similar issue in that it's not able to detect the small planets a longer orbital period. And that's because the farther and farther away the planet is, the harder um, uh, you will see in this uh, in the shift of the center of mass. So the degree of the shift, the uh, the Doppler shift, is going to be tiny, and uh, that's a that's a huge issue. In fact, it's really difficult to detect uh, Earth mass planet at our location um, using the radial velocity. I don't think uh, any instrument right now has a capability to to do so at the moment but like that's the barrier that, that all instrumentation folks are trying to achieve so that's the bias for the radio velocity um, direct imaging has this huge bias in that it has to be young system because the planet has to be bright these this light it's not from the star that light is coming from the planets themselves so the planet has to be young and they also has to be, have to be massive so that's why all these red points are all the way over here that's larger than Jupiter, that's almost going into 10 times the Jupiter size. Um, and also the same, uh, and also these planets, um, unlike the transit and radio velocity, have to be far away because you need to block first block out the starlight and pick out the light from the planet. So you have to be able to, able to resolve the planetary signature and that's just really difficult. Uh, uh, for those of you who do photography would probably understand this better than I do. It's the same thing, it's a resolution problem. Um, micro lensing is interesting. Um, it actually has the capability to fill up this space, but the problem with the micro lensing is that we're looking at um, the, we cannot really follow it up as in, we don't really know what kind of star the, these planets are orbiting around because these the star and the planet is acting as a lens. We don't actually detect the light coming from that particular star. This is light coming from somewhere else. So we need to just make some assumption about, well, like what is the probability for that star to be like a sunlight star? Or what is the probability for that star to be some other type of star? Turns out it's much more likely for us to, to detect a star that is lighter than the sun. That's just how our galaxy galaxy works. Um, so in that sense, the microlensing is uh, mostly sensitive to planets around what we call as M dwarfs, so uh, stars that are cooler and lighter than the sun. Um, so those are the major biases that, uh, that are relevant for all these four different techniques. And that's why they fill up the different parts of of the of this of the, of this diagram, um, but uh, that's why when people say something about the planet population, they they do they do this very rigorous uh, statistical analysis to correct for this biases. Eve, how many of these uh, direct imaged 
planets do we have? Is it just a handful or is it kind of yeah, a grand? Yeah, it's, it's like it's like 10 or less uh, right now. Oh, oh, uh, it's, it's about, I think it's about 15. Okay. It's, and they're it's really all, tiny. They're all kind of the same kind of planet. Yeah. So the smallest directly image planet is about two times the Jupiter mass. But, uh, one needs to be careful because when we say directly imaged planets, some of those may not actually be planets because they're way too massive. Okay. Uh, let's go to, I know JB, you've got some more. Let's go to Jeff. Uh, let's go to Jeff Kretsch. He's got a, I like his question too. Um, Jeff, are you on still? Yeah, I think I'm on. Yeah, yeah, I was wondering because we, we see planetary systems flatten into disks and of course spiral galaxies, but uh, what about things like globular clusters? What's the reason they don't collapse into a disk and instead get a globular structure? Um, yeah, good question. So globular cluster is this like old, very old structure. Um, so the reason there, well, first of all, like it's uh, at that point, it's mostly devoid of gas. Um, and and uh, it comes about due to, um, so like I've talked a bit about the gas like puffing up when it's hot. Uh, for globular cluster, it's not gas, but uh, it's a, a whole bunch of stars. And uh, the stars can also be puffed up in a sense that they're hot. And when I say hot there with the quotation mark, it's uh, when those stars are zooming by each other really quickly. So that can also be translated as the stars being dynamically hot. And if that uh, ran the random relative velocities are, are, are fast enough, then that tends to puff up the structure into more something, something I don't know, spherical rather than disky. The velocities of the stars are small enough, are large enough that they don't begin to collapse under their own gravity, I think, into smaller right. structures. Right, yeah. They're yeah, so much, it's... They have so much kinetic energy that they, they're not going to fall. The gravity of the whole cluster is not enough to pull them together into a block. It's right, not like yeah. Yeah. Right, 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 exactly. So it's always a balance, right? Uh, the fact that you see this structure over like giga year, million or giga year, it means that that structure is in balance. So as George was saying, it's the balance between the soft gravity and also also the this random motion of, of the stars. I don't think these stars actually collide directly very often. No. Oh, I don't think so, no. Not but if you live in a cluster like that, uh, looking out might be hard <laughs> because we're so bright. The stars were so bright. Yeah, thank you. Yep, thanks, Jeff. Good question. Um, let's see, Alan, do you want to ask yours? Yeah, um, actually, uh, I'll, I'll paraphrase what I said in my question. Um, in in your model of the um, of the uh, amount of formation of gas around the core it looked like there were at least two things missing or one and a half um the the time evolution of the temperature distribution within the disk as the planetary as the uh, parent star co-evolved so that you get uh, an evolving radius at which the light gases hydrogen, methane, and ammonia condense. And then as they start to condense with the dust, with the, with the heavier dust, uh, their phase changes. And they don't necessarily stay as uh, ice, as a solid. So it would seem there's a time varying component which would make it much more complicated. The second thing, which isn't in the model at all, is the various theories of the exchange of radii of planetary orbits that once you start getting massive components the planets start dancing around and don't end up where they formed and um it it, it seems that your model is essentially a quasi-static model of everything sort of happening at one radius from the star at one time um, with everything else being kept equal when in practice it's more complicated than that. 
Yeah, um, great, uh, great comment. Um, so um, as a theorist, I'm always a fan of distilling things down to something simple so that we can understand and add on these uh, complications that you mentioned. Um, so one thing that uh, I should point out is that uh, this expression changes uh, depending on what kind of disk you're dealing with. So um, you talked about the temperature of the disk. So you'll notice that the temperature of the disk doesn't come into play at all in this equation. And that happens when the, um, I'll just say technical terms here. So when the opacity is very much dominated by the dust grains. Um, and if that happens, then turns out the temperature that matters here um, is, uh, well, in any case, uh, the temperature that matters here is, is at like very deeper layers of the envelope where you transition from the convective energy transport to the radiative energy transport um, because most of the thermal inertia is in the inner convective zone. And that temperature is always fixed at 2,500 Kelvin. And that's because when the hydrogen molecules dissociate um, and that sets the transition. So that's what happens. But the temperature of the disk comes into play when the dust grains no longer become the dominant source of opacity. And this happens in the later stages of disk evolution when the grains uh, grow and settle out or the grains become larger. Um, and at that point, now the temperature of this uh, inner region is uh, evolves in lockstep with the temperature of the disk. And at that point, the temperature of the disk will also come into play. Um, there will be another factor here. And uh, I think you also talked about the motion of the planet. Um, yeah, so actually, before you before you leave that slide, are those yeah. exponents empirical or are they physical? The point they're, two and the one point they're, they're, they're physical, and they come from how the opacity depends on density and temperature. OK. Um, and I think you also talked about the motion of the planet. So this is a one motion, one uh, flavor of how the planet changes its orbit. So um, I talked a bit about this doesn't really, this doesn't come into play for orbital distance, but this, the, the gravitational perturbation between the planets will definitely change um, the eccentricity of the orbits. Um, so that's one flavor. Another flavor in which the planet will change their orbit is as they interact with the gas and that can push the planet inside. Um, yet another flavor of the ways in which the planet can change its orbit is due to the outer massive planet. So um, if you have the outer gas giant, that can actually push the planets uh, a bit closer to the star. Um, but like that will all happen sort of the end stages of the planet formation. So if you really want to do this like end to end planet formation, then uh, there are groups out there who do that, like try to try to like couple everything together. But I, I'm still uh, very cautious about that because it depends really sensitively on how we think the disk is structured. And uh, we so far, we don't have a very good understanding of how exactly the disk is structured. All right, thank you. Thanks. All right, thanks, Alan. Um, I think, uh, unless JB, you've got some follow-ups. I know you've been uh, posing some questions here. Did we cover everything for you? Um, well, I just had uh, one more question. Uh, it really had to do with the globular clusters uh, in that, uh, I mean, it's not a planetary question, really, uh, but it. my presumption was that they, they've maintained their globular structure because there isn't a great rotational process going on, and maybe they were formed by uh, a supernova within a, a dust cloud or something, or uh, they're they're actually formed uh, while the materials that they're made of are separating at escape velocity or greater. Um, so I must. Sense. Uh, yeah, so I must say I'm not a huge expert in globular cluster, but um, again, like this is uh, the balance like you, uh, you've talked about rotation. Um, so like centrifugal force comes into play, but I, for globular clusters, the most important thing is this, again, this random motion of, of the stars, which acts as like a dynamical pressure. Um, and uh, that acts against uh, the gravitational collapse. So you can then ask the question of, well, where does the random velocity come from? Um, that uh, random velocity could come from the, the initial expansion from like supernova if those 
if those sub stars were uh, were dragged by it. Um, that's one way in which uh, you could have that. Okay. I think we've covered it. I want to just make sure anybody online has any other questions they can ask. We've held uh, Eve. Thank you. We've held you over <laughs> over the hour here a little bit. Appreciate it. Um, if there are no no other questions, I did have one. Just basically, kind of maybe maybe the last one here would be like from your perspective, doing the analysis and the data, and you know you're you're obviously totally familiar with detection methods and things. What are you? What is your expectation for like what's our next big discovery, or what are you and what are you hopeful to discover in the next you know ten years or so? You mentioned a couple of satellites we're going to launch and. What are you most looking forward to? Yeah, so um, I sort of uh, talked about how excited I was about Roman, um, just because it's a bit hard to, I guess it's a bit hard to see, but like you will just notice how it fills up the space. So if I were to go back to this slide over here, it will fill up all this uh, empty space, Roman. And that just excites me so much because I think this is just a huge loss. Like we don't know what in the world is going on in this space. But um, unfortunately, this is exactly the space where we expect most of the gas giants. But we only know that for gas giants. So that's great for gas giant. But like, what do we know about these small planets? If the small planets are all uh, dominate the total exoplanetary population, but that we can really only say that inside, uh, you know, uh, orbital periods of 100 days, that's not even one AU. So what's going on all the way over here? And uh, I think Roman will really answer that. So I'm super excited about that. 